Hello, friends. Welcome to, or welcome back to Passing Dimes, your favorite volleyball podcast. Dallas, good. You? It's been a while, Josh. How are you? I'm great. I'm wonderful. Uh, Edmonton was great, and finally, after weeks and weeks of chasing, we got our guests. We finally got them. Woo! It's a big week for us. <laughs> it's been a long time coming. I'm glad it worked out. I mean, credit to them. They were super busy, and we probably bothered them at, like, peak season, but, you know, we, we finally got to sit down with them. You know what? People like to say that I'm not a bother, but I like to think, in reality, <laughs> I'm quite the bother. So let's bring them in. Uh, the creators of the One Volleyball League. So we have Joe, who played at Humber College, won probably every provincial championship, because that's all that Humber does when they're there. Uh, so would have played at Nationals at CCAA probably every year she was there, because, again, that's what Humber does. We'll, and have, played, to, we'll have to check the facts. Yeah, we'll it, see. it checks out, I think. Played pro in Australia, I believe. Good place to play. Great place to play. Good place to play Mario Kart. <laughs> and the other side, we got Jackie, who played at U of A. Also played at, like, it seems like every national championship through there. Read it at UBC a lot, though, I feel. We'll check on that. We'll get our intern to check on that, too. You know, let's just get to the good part. They started one volleyball league, and it's awesome, and they just had their finals. I think you're overlooking the huge part of Jackie's career, which is the Fisu Beach Volleyball appearance. <laughs> because, ah, indoor volleyball, I don't really care. The Fisu Beach Volleyball appearance is the hallmark that we need to talk about on this podcast. <laughs> well, let's get into it. Welcome to the show, Jackie and Joe. Hey, thank you. Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> Excited to be here. Yeah. It's a long time coming. I think we've tried to get you guys from, I think episode one we tried to get you, and <laughs> whatever we're at now, years later. <laughs> years later. <laughs> but uh, no, we're uh, we're catching up with you guys, and it's, what's a season two? Three. No, three. three. Season three. three. My sp- Clark's and number, my Clark cards. Yeah, season three, done and over with. How are you guys feeling about that? I can't believe it's already over. I feel I like this season has flown by the fastest out of any of them. And we just came off an epic weekend in Edmonton, which really capped off season three in the best possible way. And I mean, I think both of us are ready for a little bit of a break, but yeah. then back at it to kind of recap and review the season. But it was it was an awesome season. We tested out a lot of new things. Um, and I mean, some worked, some didn't. We can kind of get more into that, but um, I think it was a successful season three overall. Yeah. So for our listeners who are either casual um, audience members of the podcast or people that sort of don't know the, the nicheness that is volleyball and especially high-performance volleyball, why don't you explain sort of what you two have created and how it's come about in the sort of the lead-up in the three years that you've, you've had it going on. First off, obviously, with its name. Yeah, so we we came up with One Volleyball um, as sort of the parent company to the Premier League. That's how we kind of kicked things off. And um, we started the Challenger Series, which was a, ter- a series of elite volleyball tournaments that basically filled the basic of all needs, which was that we wanted to compete in high-level events. And what was being offered at the time wasn't really sustaining that like need to compete. And so that's how we kind of started off to bring in the volleyball community together was this series of, of tournaments. And one volleyball came about because you know after kind of looking at our experience with volleyball as a whole in the country and in the province and overseas we knew that anything that we wanted to do and any change we wanted to make we had to do together as a community it had to be um, a combined effort like two small people aren't going to be able to um, you know inflict that much change it has to be a community of one that's kind of coming together to to stand for something greater and something new and and that's where sort of one volleyball was born i like the pun you threw in the community of one yeah appreciate that yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh so okay so you came up with this idea for sort of these series of tournaments like you know the pga or the avp or the fmvb and that sort of caught on and people wanted more and people wanted more so this idea of the league came out how like you, we talk about all these leagues that are going on right now, but nobody really knows the sort of the legwork that's involved in prepping this with teams and with your athlete draft and, you know, basically starting from scratch. How does that come about? So the league actually was the goal to begin with. Yeah. From the series. Yeah, yeah. That, that sparked because Jackie and I kind of got together the summer before we started everything, and that's where we sort of brainchild this. And in order to kind of spear into that, we knew we had to get the community together. And right. that's what the challenge... They were more of like a marketing tool to get people starting to get in and like buying into like, a yeah, soft, there's enough people yeah. here to do this. There's, yeah. A soft open. Yeah, yeah. it was a soft I open. I like that. Yeah. 
Yeah, so the league really just came about from, again, just the lack of somewhere competitive for all of these elite athletes to play. And we have so many amazing athletes in Canada that go overseas and play. And so a lot of them don't even go to play national team in the summer. They're just kicking around in Toronto or wherever they're from, and they're looking for an opportunity to train. It was something that Joe and I did when we were playing. Between contracts, we would just try and jump in with universities and still touch the ball because there's nowhere else to really play. Um, Joe and I, we kind of recognize that other countries do it without having a ton of support and money behind it. Like I played in Belgium and there's maybe 50 fans that come to the games. And it was just one of those things that it was like, if they can do it there and have the support behind it, um from some sponsors and run it in smaller countries like that like why not Canada and that's kind of what brought it about originally was just you know like if other people can do it why can't we do it and we just developed a way that we didn't fully use the European model we kind of started there and worked our way back to to figure out how it could work in the our system um so we do things differently than probably any sporting industry. We kind of merged a bunch of different ideas and came together and, yeah, worked worked our way back basically from what we wanted it to be to, like, how do we get there. Right. Nice. You talk about the community there. When we go up and down the list of owners, at least you have in the Toronto League, it looks like you have the volleyball community. Like, if you're going to start something big, like Howie Grossinger and John May need to be involved, but you also have youth clubs who have been involved in all these different layers of people. Um, when you originally started, how easy was it to find owners or was that like a big challenge? Kind of. <laughs> it's gotta be a actually, story there. <laughs> yeah. It's actually pretty funny because we came up with this idea originally thinking, you know, it makes the most sense to link in the club teams because that's where we're going to get our fan base. That's where we're going to get our support from. And that's really the goal that we went after. It was like, okay, let's, let's target youth clubs. Let's try and find youth clubs that want to help, bring like adult volleyball in and they then they can kind of feed their adult team through their youth clubs similar to the way that they do in Europe with Um, academy teams yeah yeah exactly yeah the academy pro they don't have university there so the model is a little bit trickier because our athletes go to university so the affiliation would be like five six years later which yeah there's not as big of a connection as there is in Europe where it's just straight into a pro league um but that didn't really work that well. A lot of the clubs that we ended up reaching out to, I think they all deal with their own struggles of financing their clubs and um, some of them are nonprofits, yeah. so they can't really afford to like finance a pro team. Um, so we ended up having to really find another route and we were really lucky in having Dan Trimmer come on as our first owner and really like support and pump it up. And I think it's... <laughs> It's actually funny because I think it was a week out of opening night of the league that Dan signed on for two teams, and that was our very first owner, and it was a week out of the league. So we were crunch time. Like, we didn't even know how we were going to pay for anything if people didn't sign on. Like, I remember calling Joe being, like, so stressed (laughs) and thinking that if this doesn't work out, we're going to owe people... A like lot of money. way more money. This is gonna be a big problem. Yeah. Here. <laughs> and Joe is always my sounding board of like, you know what? It's gonna work out. We're gonna figure it out. We're gonna find a way. And as soon as we posted about the first owner and that like someone owns a team in this league and that whatever, honestly, it just steamrolled from there. It was like everyone wanted to be involved, and it wasn't like a week out. We had actually. Oh, on our draft oh, night, yeah. we had one team that was still not purchased, so we called it the one volleyball team because we just did, hadn't had it purchased yet, but every other team, like in that week span of us posting the very first owner being Dan, taking a men's and a women's team, to opening night, like, like it was just like a flood of interest and what's going on, and I think when you announce something big like that... Because Joe and I, before that, were just reaching out ourselves. We hadn't really marketed that you could own a team in yeah, this league. Yeah, right. Yeah. So as soon as we had actually announced that there was, like, this ownership of this team, that's when things started kind of flooding into yeah. us instead of us having to reach out. Yeah. And that's where a lot of people were calling us saying, you know, like, I want to personally own a team. I don't want, like, they weren't affiliated. Like, Howie, Aaron, Nesbaum, yeah. like, they're not affiliated 
with a club, which was what we originally thought was going to happen. And they just, they wanted to own a team. They were really interested. And like you said, like we have all the, like the big players in the volleyball community that kind of came together to help us out. And um, it was, it was pretty cool in that way because it all really, even though we planned it for well, almost a year, everything kind of fell into pieces a week before. <laughs> we actually had um, a sponsor lined up and he was affiliated with somebody in the volleyball community. And throughout the process of like talking to him about it and really pitching it, he got so hyped. And he was the first one who kind of said to us like, can I just buy this team myself? Like, can I be the owner? Mm -hmm. Because we were trying to get him on as a sponsor. And he was like, I want to sponsor, but I also want to buy a team. And we were like, well, that's not really like what we're trying to do. And then, but he was the first person where we kind of like after that went and looked at each other and we were like, hey, so actually that's not a bad idea. And that's kind of when we started to open up to that, the possibilities of that. And then when people started to reach out, it was just like, yes, 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 yes. And it just all fell. So how many teams are in the Toronto League now? So we still have our same model of four women's teams, four men's teams. We haven't changed from our very first year. And is there any plans to expand beyond four teams? I think in the long term, probably the, the tough situation that we always run into every year, because we talk about it every year, yeah. is the fact that if you start to expand the league, you just need to have the athletes there to be able to support it. Right. And we would never want to dilute. Spread the, yourself too thin. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because we have such a strong league that, and this is the reason people play. So as soon as you start to add more teams, and if you're kind of diluting that pool of athletes and you don't have enough, then it brings down the level and the kind of competitiveness that we're going for. Um, plus, it's just it's such a short season to fit in. You would have to restructure how we do it right now, just right. because we. We only have eight weeks to kind yeah. of finish the whole league, start to finish, if we want all the pro players to play. So, well, I mean, I'm glad you talked about like the the level of play because people have actually been using this as a platform to further their professional careers. And we talked uh, about Joey Jarvis, who used mm -hmm. his time in the one league to sort of parlay that into an FTC invite. So we have guys who are playing and women who are playing in this league using the tape from this league getting contracts, getting money, sort of further that cycle of, of expanding volleyball. So that's awesome to see. Joey's kind of our poster boy in that <laughs> sense. We quite, in like, all, it literally, he's, he's on posters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, he is. But he's like, he is the best case scenario in, in terms of like us being able to assist our national team and assist our, you know, greater powers that be because they maybe would have never ever seen him in any other environment right. except for this and he didn't play college university like he didn't play Ontario team it just wasn't on his radar and this league was we kind of were like man you're good he was playing in our challenger series we're like you should totally try out for this league mm -hmm. and he blossomed from there he just but he also has the attitude that he's like tell me what to do better tell me what I'm doing like what else do I need to do how can I grow how can I be better he was just absorbing everything and so get him getting the national team invite was like awesome because yeah. that's how we feel like we can give back right and he's also such an athletic guy but he'd never had any technical formal volleyball training so you add that and yeah. get a good coach on him like he i i just see big things in his future for sure because yeah. he's has so far to go because he's never been trained right yeah. so it was pretty cool even like in the second year to see him be like on aaron's team under brenda so he Finally, and I remember her excitement with working with him because mm -hmm. he's so raw that she's just like, he has, I have so much to give him because he's never been trained before. Right. Um, so it was really, it was really exciting yeah. to see that. And he's not the only one. Like if you yeah. look at Alex Duncan Tebow, like he went overseas and got an amazing contract and it was literally just from game tape of the league. And, and I'll I, tell you firsthand, I played at the university and he sucked. <laughs> <laughs> whoa, whoa. <laughs> And yeah. no, I mean, not now, but I mean, when I was in, what, fourth year and he was in first year, he uh, he was filling my water bottle pretty, pretty poorly. <laughs> but honestly, that's the great thing about this league is, like, volleyball players peak late. Like, yeah. you peak in volleyball when you're in your 30s. Right. And a lot of people play only... Just look at LP, university. league MVP. Yeah. <laughs> I'm kidding. But, like, but seriously, <laughs> people peak in, like when they're 30, but they only play till they're 22, 23 because they stop playing after university, yeah. which is such a shame because people like Alex, like they have so much room to grow yeah. and they have, they have so much more learning to do. And because volleyball is such a technical and mental sport, like you have so much 
growing that way too that it's unfortunate that people stop mm -hmm. playing so early um, before they even have like reached any of their potential. So speaking of growing, you guys took your league from Toronto, sort of centralized everything out of the city, but expanded it into Calgary. How did that come about? And I know that we've sort of talked about it in previous episodes that the the west coast of the country, obviously with you playing in Alberta, the level of Can West seems to be a lot better than the other conferences within the CIS. How did that come about to sort of expand it and, and why Calgary of all places? So I think Calgary was just the most seamless place to go next. Um, with me having gone to U of A, I had a lot of connections with the athletes there. And um, I, yeah, I guess that's the, the we knew we wanted to expand. Yeah, yeah. We yeah. We and we it just made expand. sense. We, we had looked into Montreal. It was really tough there with the language barrier, with a couple different things. Even to run a Challenger series, we tried to run one there. And we just had so many challenges. Um, that Calgary was just kind of seamless and a, a lot of my university friends had been asking about the league and what's going on and it was literally a random conversation uh, when I was out there for a wedding that turned into Jaron Mueller who's the guy who runs our uh, Calgary League, our Calgary League director and I just like having having a beer and talking about it and him being like I'm kind of interested and then when I brought it back to Joe, I'm like, you know what, I think this would be a perfect opportunity. I trust Jaron as a really good friend of mine, right. and I think he would be perfect for it. He works in sports, so he knows he knows that side of it. And Calgary was a great place to go. They have a lot of good athletes there. Calgary and Edmonton have a lot of good athletes. It was actually hard picking between yeah. the two. Um, but I think with having Jaron in Calgary, it really made that an easy decision. And the nice thing is with Alberta is people – will go to Calgary for the summer to play. We had that happen already yeah. where like Edmonton, people who are living in Edmonton will go for the summer just to play in a league, which is awesome. And honestly, it's been, it's been a huge, the first year of having it was extremely stressful just because Joe took on, Joe and I took on like another province to deal yeah. with. And even though we had someone on the ground there, it's still just like yeah. the marketing Shit, of yeah. it and getting them up to speed. With, yeah, getting them up to speed with what's going on. Plus, trusting the them to execute your sort exactly. of model and yeah, trusting them to execute. But then the markets are different, so yeah. also trying to figure out, you know, like what can we change that is going to be okay and still going to fall under our brand. And so it was it was challenging the first year, but it was exciting too because I think that Calgary is Alberta in general is a volleyball province like people love volleyball there when I played at university we had like 500 people come out to our games like people love it there they'll go to watch and so they had a lot of success even just getting people on board and supporting so that was really cool and we sort of have seen your model taken with other provinces like Vancouver has the Super League and I don't know how closely you guys have, have spoken with with them about that but would there be any sort of plans to amalgamate that into your your brand next or I know that we talked about maybe not spreading yourselves too thin but I guess the plan would be to sort of create more yeah expand into more cities and yeah think, that's the ultimate goal yeah. to be in a number of different cities and I think it's just evaluating where it makes the most sense especially with our model being in the summer BC is tricky because they're such a beach town right like everyone there plays beach and the nice thing with the Super League for them is that they're in the fall, so right. they don't run into the same challenges that we might run into in the summer. So we're still kind of evaluating where the next place to go is. Like I still think that I still think going to Quebec is a great idea. I just think there's additional challenges that we're going to run into there. Manitoba is something that's yeah. definitely on our list. They just lost both their national teams in the last ten years, and they're definitely a volleyball city. So um, yeah, we're definitely thinking about the best way to expand and the most important thing like I said with Calgary is just having someone that we know and trust and is going to be able to execute for us on the ground because we can't in, in Calgary the first year we were only able to get out there once right. so yeah if any of our listeners are, are in a city and they're really interested like when you speak of challenges is there something they could get a head start on that might help like what is the biggest barrier is it finding a facility is it finding volunteers is it getting like the PSO on board like if somebody from, say, Winnipeg or even out east is listening, saying, like, I want to take a run at this, what could they maybe take a couple steps into helping you guys figure out if it is even possible for them? Yeah, I think the really biggest thing would be venue is always huge because it's usually our biggest cost. Um, so 
we have been lucky and able to get partnerships with venues um, and just having the athlete base like the the most important thing is to be well connected with the athletes because as we found and as Jaren's found like in the first year of starting it up it's honestly convincing people to play because especially in Toronto when we first started like no one's ever seen this before. No one really knows what it is. It's nice now because they have a backdrop of us being around for three years and they have a better idea seeing it. But it's every even when we went to Calgary, it was it's convincing the athletes that this is something that they should do, they should buy into. Um, so it needs to be something. But that it's well going to be worth their while too. Like yeah. In the beginning, it was really tough. Even coaches we chatted with who we tried to get to connect to their teams. Um, they were kind of like, well, I get like what you're trying to do, but there's always the question of, is it going to be successful? And I don't know you guys well enough to know that you're capable of doing this. And sometimes when you've never seen it before, you really can't envision what's possible. Right. right. And so that's where that convincing has to go. It's like, mm -hmm. and now that we've, like Jackie said, like we've already done it in two provinces and people can see that it's successful. Like we just yeah. did a Canada cup for goodness sakes. Like yeah. that is another sort of testament to the success and the the want that is coming from the athletes. Speaking of that, big shout out to the individual who ran the Canada Cup on the beach slide, quick, Josh Neckel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that might confuse the branding a little bit. We had uh, a U20 beach event in Edmonton that was uh, yeah, for the beach provincial right. teams. That uh, <laughs> Yeah, I think we played second fiddle to the Canada Cup for one volleyball, but you know, the kids had fun. It's really kids stuff. <laughs> it's always for really the kids, Josh. We, we didn't have a, a beer garden or like a lot of fans, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> Good time had by all. Yeah, right? That's all we need. Uh, that's really cool, though. I'm super excited that uh, that you guys have obviously done this and that it's sort of taken off. I mean, the next question is, where do you sort of see it going? I mean, this is the hard interview question here for the entry-level position, but where do you see yourself in five years? So, it's interesting because when you first start something like Jackie said, we did we did look at, okay, what is it that we want to accomplish and work backwards from there? But obviously, any like startup can attest to things come at you that you maybe didn't plan for. You didn't expect, you didn't expect the market to react this way, or it, you know, went better than you thought. Like, what we thought originally our five-year goal was is probably, like, pretty different, like, still along the same lines, but pretty different from when we first started. So, it's tricky because I think we knew that after year three, we were going to sit down and really sort of reevaluate, like, yes, we want to go to new provinces and, and make this even bigger. But um, I think that we've, in the small sense, accomplished our initial goal, which was to kickstart professional volleyball. And I think the next step in that five to ten year, you know, plan is to actually have professional volleyball. Because even though we market this as professional volleyball, that is something that we need to say, one, because we are trying to operate in a very professional manner, so that is that sort of like tie in there, but also that when we're approaching sponsors and we're approaching partners, like we want them to know how serious that that this is, that we're taking this and that it's going to become. The reality is that we have a really great mix of pro and players, right? We have the pros and then we have the university players. So right. something that we um, started doing this year was paying the um, Sweet 16 is what we called them. And that's sort of like our introductory step into creating these professional contracts. The athletes are contracted directly to the league as opposed to the teams. Like in, in other leagues, that's something else that we are doing differently that we didn't sort of anticipate because I know we talked about doing this in year two. And it was kind of like didn't really make sense and there's a lot of responsibility that goes on the, on the teams and it's not a very big league. So we kind of looked at it a different way this year and that's sort of the direction we wanted to go. So five five-year plan is to... Um, build up that pro side of it more, but while still engaging the amateur side, because I think there's a lot of takeaway for those people. Um, they get to take a away a lot back to their own environment. Like Jordan Figuera is one of them. He just posted on Instagram and he's like, amazing experience. Obviously he's a phenomenal athlete and he's on a team that just won the first ever Canadian cup. Like that's a pretty cool experience. But what he said in his post was more inspiring because he was so inspired by the athletes that were around him and the amount of knowledge that they had. Right. And he was really excited to take that back to his team at U of T because that's what impact he can now bring from his experience there to the 14 athletes on his team, which is honestly like what we couldn't ask for more than that. Yeah, I think we have such a unique model in the fact that we are kind of a semi-pro because the pro players have so much to give back to yeah. these athletes. and. 
I know like Jack Peckham came up to me after the finals in Toronto and he was just like, you have no idea how much this experience means to me because I grew up looking up to LP, looking up to Yoren as mm-hmm. athletes. Like, they're 10 years older than him. So he watched them play when he was a kid, and now he gets the opportunity to stand on the same court as them and play with them. That's and pretty cool. it's, pretty, it's pretty amazing that opportunity that these athletes get, and it's just going to help grow the sport at every level, um, which we definitely don't want to take away. That's something unique that we love about the league. Yeah, for sure. Joel was talking about that uh, on the episode that we did with him where he's totally brand new to varsity volleyball and yeah. he's getting to play with all these guys where he's like like a sponge, right? He's soaking up all these this knowledge and seeing all this all the ways that guys sort of play and his perception of like, Oh, I should be doing this, like well, well no, like no, if you want to be successful, like this is the sort of the path to to be. Like he's talking about Joran Zeman. Doesn't really hit the ball all that hard, but scores a a shit ton, uh, right? Yeah. 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 Yeah, and it's crazy because a lot of these athletes, like I know when I was in university, I didn't know anything about yeah. going to play pro and going to do all this stuff. Like, um, even with having national team experience, you still don't really hear about all the other opportunities that there are. And I think this league brings that because you have these pro players coming in, giving advice to these guys that are like, I want to go play pro. Like, what do I do? How do I get there? And it's kind of just like a natural flow of. Um, experience and information to these athletes to help them get to the next level. So here's my hot take for the day. We've had the can of the cup go down. We've had a winner crowned. Time to pony up, Glenn. Time to get the national team to play can of the cup winners for the real team Canada. Ooh, that would be pretty <laughs> cool. That winner pretty gets cool. the jerseys and <laughs> so you lose, everything's on the line. Everything Everything's on, on the line. line. I like it. No, we've actually, we've talked to the national team on both sides quite a bit. I mean, um, we, would, we, we would love to support them as much as possible, and we hope that they see the benefit in us being around. And um, it's, it's, we haven't really been able to get too much back and forth yet with them but we're hoping that we'll be able to do you know some exhibition matches or some f- like fun interaction between us and the national team because it's it would be interesting to see we have a lot of guys that used to play national team we have a lot of guys aspiring to play national mm-hmm. team and it would just be fun to be able to get a little bit of competition yeah for sure i know that uh, on the men's side they play uh montreal quite a bit in queens because they're so close to cat so yeah my I mean, people are taking a bus out there. Or no something. kidding. <laughs> Laval fans are probably missing their shit out there. I think they play Laval more than they play Montreal. I Montreal. never even heard of them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's go into detail on Canada Cup. I'm sure to the casual fan, it's like, yeah, it makes sense that the two leagues play off. But logistically, that had to be a nightmare of how did you book plane tickets? It was in the athlete's <laughs> contract that they had to go, right? Like, how did you get involved yeah. with the Edmonton FIV? Like, there's so many layers to this other than, like, casual fans going, yeah, you know, league winners should play league winners. Easy. Yeah, yeah, athletes have to, yeah, yeah. Easy, easy. yeah. People, people have no idea. <laughs> um, like, you're right. In Like, athletes, when they um, fill out their draft application, they do have to let us know what they're going to and what they're missing because um, teams obviously want to draft a team of people who are going to be available. But there's, like, life things that happen, like weddings and stuff you can't account for. But So we do ask them that ahead of time. But um, this, like... Huge shout out needs to go to yeah. John May because he is the catalyst behind pulling the events together. He said, I'm running this FIVB event. I love volleyball. I want to make it better. I know that we can combine these events and make my event more successful, your event more successful, which is honestly the entire reason why we started One Volleyball is because we knew that coming together, we're going to be more successful. So that was an obvious yes for us that we're going to come together on this and, and put together something awesome. And um, he organized a lot of it. He spearheaded, you know, a lot of the behind the scenes stuff because um, his team was out there. And yeah, and he, he so John also owns two teams in our league now. Yeah. He started off um, with just one, and he loves. He the picked league. up that first team, the unknown team, the first year. Yeah, yeah. He was the last person that picked up the unknown team um, after the draft in our first year, and he he has so much support for the league and such buy in, and he like his belief in kind of our vision of bringing that community together is so strong. Like he has yeah. that same, that same feeling that, you know, forever we fought against each other to like at different leagues, different, you know, communities have kind of battled against each other to get things done where it doesn't make any sense. Like if we all work towards 
the same thing, it's going to be way more successful. Right. And as you guys may know, he ran that beach tour back in uh, Canada or Toronto back in the day. Toronto. Canada yeah. or Toronto? Yeah. Both. It wasn't Ontario. No, I think it might have been Sorry, sorry. Yeah, that should have been Ontario. Or well, that tour was both. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so he has experience, you know, kind of grinding it out like we are. And he said that to us a couple of times. Like, I've been where you are. Right. Um, back in the day, I've sort of like, I've seen, you know. And the nice thing is too, he's seen it as in the same light we have because he played. Yeah. He played and he, he ran it. it. And I know we've gotten kind of backlash before for playing in our own league, but, um. That's why we started it. Yeah. It's part of the reason that we started it is because we wanted somewhere to play too, you know. And, um, so it's nice to have him on board and supporting that because he's been through it before. Yeah. So I don't know if you guys know this, but we're like. There's Tim and Sid, and then there's us. So we're nationally syndicated, <laughs> and we've got a lot of pull. We're doing a lot of big things here. So, I mean, we would like to get TSN involved with you guys. How can we start to see One Volleyball on television, on Sportsnet, on TSN? What do we need to do to get that 8 to 9 p.m. time slot away from the Toronto Raptors and onto One Volleyball? <laughs> Oh man, <laughs> I don't know. What do you think, Jack? I think we just need. I don't know. Like I think the the vibe, the fun thing about the vibe of that Canada Cup was you could see the potential of what the league could yeah. look like in a bigger scale. Um, we were in it a little bit of a tighter gym. Half of the gym was set up as like a beer garden, and then the other half was a stand. It was just. An environment that you wanted to be in and it was such a cool atmosphere yeah. that I feel like we as the volleyball community we, we do have a kind of like different atmosphere of a sport that we provide and I, you, I don't know I just it's kind of like, getting blown up on yeah. like a 10 times scale yeah like for sure having a massive almost like a massive party slash like the volleyball is happening yeah. and it's super intense people are running yeah. around screaming like it was it was, it was like just, raptors playoffs it was like every yeah. point people were just like Freaking going out. nuts yeah going nuts and it was all the matches were so tight they both went to five sets like but yeah. that's the environment it's a, you're right it's a huge spectator that's what people want to watch yeah, yeah totally sure. um the other point being is i think to get this really involved you you should probably have the support of the federation so i mean Volleyball Canada, I think, really needs to step up to the plate here and sort of approach you guys and say, hey, listen, we need to create this, not necessarily just Toronto Calgary, but let's use Volleyball Canada as a platform mm -hmm. to sort of reach out to, to all the provinces or even, like you guys said, with the national team, sort of syndicate big matches, right? Canada Cup winners versus the national team. Uh, you know, have the FTC teams play in a, not necessarily a challenger event, but sort of a marquee matchup and then advertise it, say, hey, listen, you know, our Canadian teams are trying to qualify at the Olympics. We have a pro team in Canada domestically. How, like, that, it seems like it's easy TV sell. You know what else? Something I reached out to them um, a while ago about was the World Club Championships. So that's something that I had reached out and just kind of, like, put a bug in their ear about that because we're getting to the point now where we kind of have that, landscape and you're right that support does have to come from the national team because one they have to send you but also it's expensive true so actually as a good alternative what volleyball canada has been doing is they've been sending the cis champions yeah. to the mm -hmm. club championships what they should be doing and i know that all of volleyball canada listens to me because they <laughs> super respect me and I have always treated me really well <laughs> Is that they should be sending the one volleyball champions as a representative for Norseka to the FIVB Club World Championship? Well, I think it's more applicable. I think just in the past, we've never had that club potential. Like every other sort of European right. league or whatever has that. We've just never had the opportunity. So I think maybe it's like just a, a slight shift mm -hmm. that we can maybe make moving forward. But but I think even just like our, our national team and our PSOs here, they we need their support. And I always say this, and I always kind of laugh about it, and I love Ontario Volleyball. I love you guys. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. Whoa, whoa, whoa. This is pretty... an international podcast. Yeah, oh, yeah. More than Ontario here. <laughs> yeah. But, like, they've, they've been supportive for sure, but it needs to go to the next level of, like, I always laugh that their slogan is Volleyball for Life because they support volleyball up until 18U. And it's not, that's not Volleyball for Life. You can play volleyball until 
you're in your 70s. You to know? be fair, like, that comes off a lot smoother than volleyball till 18. Totally. <laughs> but, if, but if you're going to spout that as your slogan of your entire organization, then support it. For sure. And so I, I challenge them, and Joe and I challenge them all the time, and like, how can you help us when we're trying to help the volleyball community? Yeah. How can you help us support these Ontario athletes that we're now proving that we're helping send them on pro contracts? Like, you can support them after they've left the club system in a lot of ways, and we're one of them. And so it's challenging those PSOs to think like that. And Volleyball Alberta, too. I mean, those are the only two organizations that we deal with right now because those are the only two provinces we're in. But we could use a lot more support from them, and we need it. And even just in getting information, like, they are, they have all of, they hold all the cards, right? right? Yeah. So, like, get the kids out. It's something we wanted to do forever is get more of the kids out to the games. Like, what do we need to do? Maybe maybe having it on Thursday nights isn't the best idea because we can't get kids out. But, like, we need to figure it a way for it to kind of run up the spectrum of club. We need kids that are 12 to be watching our athletes and saying, I want to be yeah, there, you know? Like, it sure. happens in every other sport in our country, but it doesn't happen in volleyball. I played volleyball at the highest level. When I was a kid, I, I didn't know who anyone was. I never went to a university game. I never watched our national team. Like, that needs to change. If we want to get to the way we're going as a pro league, we need the buy-in of the youth. I say scrap the CFL. Just put you guys in. I agree. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody cares about three Who puts their kids anyway. in football anyway? Yeah, especially Canadian football. You know what? I, I appreciate... Um, the challenges that nonprofits face because um, I ran Babington, Ontario for four years. So I did all the grant applications, the funding, the reports. I did the extra funding applications. Like, I, I understand the challenges that they're under because everybody in sport is under the same funding model. So they're getting the same questions that I'm getting and they have to answer the same questions that the government is sending them. The challenge that they have as, and this is why I can appreciate it, is that the business model is coming from the government down and they're not necessarily sport people but right. as a nonprofit you still have to apply to that so I get the challenges on that point and I get staffing challenges I think that um, so that's honestly really interesting that you ran it from the sort of the nonprofit side and you ran it from the NSO side um, to sort of sum everything up and you guys have done a really good job sort of explaining what the model of the program is and what you guys have been trying to accomplish for our big money listeners out there, what's the best way that not only sort of capital investment, but just everybody on the street, what's the best way that we can support you and support One Volleyball to watch this continue to grow, say year four, year five, year 10? Well, I think showing up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like having the energy in the gym makes the athletes play better and gets them engaged more and then gets their friends engaged more. And just It's sort of like a spiraling effect. So I think... Um, yeah, I coming think, out to support. I think coming out to support, watching on the webcast. I mean, coming out to the support is obviously better than watching the webcast because it creates a better atmosphere. But also, like Joe and I are very open to feedback, and I think mm -hmm. that we've seen that over the last three years. We've changed a lot of things because we're trying to find the best model and the best way to make this a sustainable league. And so, if you guys have ideas, if you guys have things that you think could make the fan experience better, so we can get more people out, then we want to know. Yeah. We're, we're very open to, you know, changing the way that we do things in order to best accommodate both the athletes and the fans. But I think to that note, there are actually so many things that we wanted to do this year that were cool, hype things, fun, like engaging. And the reality is that we don't have enough people yeah. to man it. And that right. kind of ties back into like we need support from people because – we're relying on volunteers. Jackie and I are volunteers. Like, to make this sustainable, it needs support on staffing side. Mm -hmm. And kind of going back to like the OVA, like I can appreciate where they're coming from um, because that's why we started One Volleyball. Like we knew that they couldn't do it on their own. We knew that like us going to them and saying run an elite program isn't going to happen right off the ground in one year. Like it takes a community of people to do things and yeah. we were really passionate about this area of volleyball and we knew it was an area that we could give back. It's hard to hit the ground running but you guys have you know you guys seem to be in full sprint now and I, I know a lot of people that are really appreciative of what you guys are, are doing and I think uh, I can speak for sort of everybody in this community we're really excited to see where it comes from here.
Uh, one thing we do like to ask our, our guests who have played in the one league is just who were they kind of blown away with that they get to see live every week? Like when I was a part of it last year, I think Steve Hunt mm -hmm. watching live is unbelievable, and we were lucky to have Becky Pavin on our team where you're, just, you're kind of lucky just to be able to see them every week. Is there anyone that you guys have been like, wow, I didn't realize that so-and-so was so good now that you got to see them every week? For me, it was actually really fun watching Eric play because he did play in year one, and then he took off a year and then um, came back this year because, you know, he hurt, he hurt his back and he had some issues. But it was really fun watching him play this year because he kind of played with a different kind of energy and appreciation, and he was just a character. Like, I had a lot of fun knowing him after because I didn't know him before this. He was probably up there on like some of my favorite people to watch. Not surprising from a talent standpoint because obviously he's a talent, but yeah, I think who else would I say like Terrell? I always love yeah. watching Terrell. Like he, love him. he oh, semis. Yeah, like he just gets <laughs> he just gets into it. He get he kind of gets wishes rattled all time. easily, but also like makes him play better. And he, I don't know, he's a he's a beast of an athlete, so it's fun to watch him play. I think he also might be the first volleyball. Instagram influencer. Totally. 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 <laughs> yeah, no, he's he's super fun to watch and I know the kids like I we did a showcase match at um Nationals and I know the kids all came out and like were just the reactions on their faces when he's going up to swing and stuff. It was awesome to watch. So he's yeah. he was a fun player to watch. What about on the girl side? I would say like um Nico is always my favorite player to watch on the girl side because she just has so much finesse. She's just She's such an athlete. And yeah. She's super fun to watch, too. Alina was um, a treat this year, too. And, I mean, I'm biased because I got to play with her. But, like, that girl is always fun in game. She's always smiling. She's always in, like, a really good spirit. And she hits OT all the time. I don't know how. She had, like, her kill percentage was, like, I swear, 95%. Haven't looked at the stats, so don't quote me, but... We'll get our intern to look yeah, at Yeah, we'll get our intern to look at it. <laughs> and I know in Calgary, um, they had a girl that came up from the States that played for Cold Garden, and she was... She was killing it. Like, yeah. she was awesome to watch. So much fun. She had an amazing experience coming up from the States. She plays pro during the year, and um, her agent actually contacted the coaches at Cold Garden and asked about the league and mm -hmm. what was going on, and they were like... Yes, she should absolutely come up. They supported her right. um, finding a place to stay, and like she she can't wait to come back next year. So it's that's a really cool story from the league this year as well. And Nat, I can never remember what her last name. It's like Clivonina or something like that. Sorry, guys, my bad. But she was the libero of the year out in Calgary, and she was a lot of fun to watch. Same kind of like energy. She just brings she pulls her team together. It's those kind of energetic. Um, all stars who just kind of like they go for the ball no matter what. Like they they want to hit it as hard as they can. They're gonna find a way to score. They're gonna find a way to get it off the ground. Like those people to me are the people that I want to play with because they make me want to play harder. Yeah, for sure. I'm honestly half disappointed that you guys didn't Ricky Bobby it and say, you know, my favorite player is me because I'm awesome <laughs> and I'm the best. <laughs> and to be honest with you, there wouldn't be a team if it wasn't for me. So. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's great. I'm glad that you like all those people, but a little disheartening to say the least. <laughs> that's hilarious. That's hilarious. Um, no, but uh, it's great for you guys to come on after all these years of hounding you. Mm. And, uh, you know, both Josh and I are super thankful to uh, to have you guys on. So thanks again. Can't we, wait for We can't let them off the hook now. It's story time. That is true. Our listeners uh, love the story. <laughs> that is true. So I forgot the most important piece to this, and that is... Every episode, we try and get some sort of hilarious coincidence or ridiculous scenario that has come up with just you guys in the volleyball community. We've had people stick their hands in toilets. We've had people get held up at gunpoint. Um, we've had people board planes without really knowing where they're going. Uh, I'm glad that you guys are both looking at me with pure confusion because I just <laughs> named three stories that just involved myself. <laughs> you know what? I have, a, I, have a good, I have a good one. So, um, well, I used to play national team. and Not a big deal. Not, not a big deal. Um, and they used to always host tournaments for Norsecas in, like, the sketchiest places because they're like, where can we host this that it's super cheap and we don't have to spend a lot of money? Yeah. We don't care if it's safe for the athletes or not safe for the athletes. So I've been to <laughs> Tijuana, Mexico, like three times. Uh, no, I like the back of my hand. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but 
we were there one year, and after the tournament, they're like, yeah, we're going to host this awesome after party. Like, everybody's got to come over. It's like a two-minute walk from the hotel. And so we're like, okay, cool, cool. Um, so we're all at the hotel. We're ready to leave. And, like, they're, like, telling us we have to leave in a group so that they can make sure that, like, nothing happens to us on the walk over. No joke. It's 500 meters away. Um, so we leave the hotel, and all of a sudden I had a couple drinks, whatever, um, and there's just these guys on these massive white trucks. In the back, there's this massive machine gun in the middle of it, and then there's six guys in the back of the truck standing up masked with machine guns, and then two guys on each window of the truck, both have machine guns at the windows, and they're just circling. There's like probably ten of them around the block of this community where they had the volleyball players and they're just circling the community all night long to make sure nothing happens so we're walking to this bar and they're all just like circling us like massive trucks with machine guns and I was so scared so I decided I would bring a roadie with me <laughs> so I brought a beer from the hotel and I was terrified I'm like these guys are gonna like shoot me because I have a beer <laughs> but it was insane and then once we got to the bar they just like continued to circle at the bar it was so it was like the most uh, professional surreal, environment you could be in super professional like just terrifying but but that's what you have to deal with when you're on the road with national team and like or in pro even yeah. and you kind of get put into these situations where you're like in an unknown territory you're in an unknown place and like Again, volleyball doesn't have that much money, so the fact that they have to run the tournaments in places that are going to be, like, affordable for them, that's where you kind of end up. I know that all too well. It's scary stuff. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, that's a good one, Dal. We got another good story to add to the list. You know? Yeah. Stuff another, that you just don't expect. Yeah. Like, oh, I'm on the national team. I play volleyball. This is going to be great. And another, it seems like another, <laughs> South <laughs> Ameri <laughs> another South American country with more guns. It just sort of <laughs> seems like it's part of the course now. <laughs> Perfect. We can wrap it up there. Thank you so, so much for being on the show. I mean, scheduling took a while, but I'm glad they just didn't flat out say no. I can't wait for a Premier League <laughs> podcast 2.0. Yeah. There's so much more to talk about. So much to talk about. Reoccurring guests. Reoccurring Super guests. best friend of the show, Ben Saxon, is going to have some competition now. Yeah. 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 Equally best friend of the show, Jackie Alice. <laughs> <laughs> Can't wait for Dallas and Josh to come volunteer next year for the league. Yeah, <laughs> commentators. We can make that work. <laughs> for the fans, for the fans, for the kids, for the kids. Have your for people call our people. You yeah. know, these things happen. We're way above board. Yeah, you we'll know. see we, what we'll TSM if they let us go. <laughs> <laughs> no, but uh, thanks again, guys. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Sweet. Thanks, guys. That's it. Thanks for listening, and thanks again to Jackie and Joe for joining the show. If you're a fan of the One Volleyball League or want to learn more, you can check out previous episodes with star players Becky Pavin, Eric Madsen, Chris Tao, Joel Hannon, or owner Aaron Nussbaum. Please subscribe to Passing Dimes wherever you get your podcasts so you don't miss out on any bonus content, and stay tuned for episodes every Friday. Keep those comments coming. We enjoy hearing from you. and Please leave a five-star review. Stay excellent, friends.